Welcome to the Virgin London Marathon Show and I'm joined by a very special guest by the name of Greg White. Professor Greg White, you're a professor in applied sports science. That's exactly right. <laughs> good, good. I, that was going to be a tough get one to get out, that one. Yeah. So what are you up to today at the show? I'm just actually wandering around, meeting some people, some of the guys that I've done some sort of technical work with in terms of fabrics and drink manufacturers, those type of things. Uh, taking a look around, it's a fantastic place to be. Uh, and meeting up with some old friends who I've coached in the past and currently coach. You're obviously a professor and you're very much involved in sports, but you always have been involved in sports and you were an athlete yourself, twice Olympian in, in modern pentathlon. Do you ever come to a place like this and think, oh, you know, I'd kind of like to be back there <laughs> at the peak of my fitness? It's an interesting one, actually, because I, I, don't, I don't actually hanker to be back at the peak. I mean, you know, I remember the days of, you know, 40 hours of training a week, of getting up at half five every single morning when it's raining, you know, going to the pool, then coming home, and then going to the gym, and then running, and you know, they're tough times, without any shadow of doubt. To be an elite is a really tough environment, so I don't miss that, but I do miss the competition. I love the competition, uh, and, and when you come to an expo like this, you know, in preparation for the, the marathon, you do think to yourself, God, I wish I was running on Sunday, it'd be fantastic, but the elite side, my day is gone. <laughs> led you know a very very interesting life since your competitive days and, and, and massively busy you know when I talk to you and hear about everything you've done you think my goodness how, how do you fit that in to your life and um, you, you were involved with triathlon for a long period of time yep. um, as the as, as the, the physiologist, the yep. physiologist the national squad, yeah. and also three Olympics with their acclimatization program uh, with, with Team GB so Team I, GB, yeah, yeah. I was the director of research for the British Olympic Association I then went on to be director of science and research for the English Institute of Sport so it, 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 it's it, it's a sporting career which has moved from being an athlete to actually helping athletes. So it's, it's an intriguing one. Talking about acclimatisation, it is the London Marathon uh, weekend. What the weather conditions are going to be like, and how do you think the the athletes are going to handle? Well, it's an interesting one because it is you know it's the forecast is for a good day, which is great. Uh, I think it depends where you are in the standings. You know, elite versus you know the, the eight hours, but a, a warm day. You know, a warm spring day here in the UK, 18 degrees centigrade, isn't that hot. But when you're unacclimatized to it, you know, when you know this week it's been six, seven, eight degrees. When that bumps up suddenly to 18 degrees, that can have a really profound effect. And if you're not acclimatized, that's the key issue. Is it's not how hot it is, it's how acclimatized you are to it. It can really have a big effect on you. So if it's warm, people need to take care of themselves. You know, hydration is absolutely crucial. Uh, but it's all those other little things, you know, excessive sweating is going to cause some problems for people. It's going to cause feet to swell a little bit more than they normally do, so those toes are in danger. So the weather makes a profound effect on performance without any shadow of doubt. But I think suddenly looks okay. Probably affects the, the elite runners slightly less because, as you said, they're out there for a lot less time you yep. know, than the guys perhaps at a sort of back end five, six you know, hours yep. plus. So it's going to affect them a lot more than it will to the elite runners. No, definitely. And, and I think the, the key issue around those guys as well is that they're actually they're out there for less time, obviously. But actually, importantly, they've probably been on the warm weather camp this year. You know, they've had some pre acclimatization. Exactly. Also, they, they've got experience, they know how to run in the heat, they know about pace judgment. They know how much fluid they've got to take on board, etc. They've got that experience. That's where the sort of the newcomer to the to the marathon doesn't have that. So they're out there for a lot longer, and they don't know quite as much what to do. Not quite the experience, and so that's why they, can't, they may suffer a bit more. 26.2 miles is a long way to run. You know, yeah. we're here. There's there's tens of thousands of people, people racing on Sunday. And you slightly kind of just take it for granted that it's a normal <laughs> thing to run a marathon. But you know, really for a human being, it's it's not that normal, is it? Absolutely not. I mean, this is tough. And it's interesting actually because because public psyche has changed because there's 36,000 runners there. Every year we see it on telly. There's almost a perception actually. Well, you know, so you can run a marathon now. I mean, when when we started this this road, you know, in the early 80s. People didn't believe that you could run a marathon. You know, it's like crazy distances you know, to try and run. Now it's sort of become part of the social conscience that we think we can do it. It is still a long way. It's still over 26 miles. And it is still a brutally difficult event to complete and to do it well. And, and back at the, the, the top end of the, the elite runners, the, you know, two hours and a bit for the guys and hoping yeah. to see some maybe sub 220 for the women. 
as a, as a scientist and a professor of sports science, what do you think it actually takes, apart from the numbers, apart from that kind of that big VO2 max and things, to make a great marathon runner? Do you know, it, uh, it's, a, it's a great question because it, I mean, it is multifactorial. Performance at any level is multifactorial. We often get entrenched in this debate of nature versus nurture. You know, are you born elite athlete or are you made into an elite athlete? And actually, it's both of them. And, and I think that there's a whole host of things that affect it. It's, it's the soci sociology of, of the individual, what surrounds them, what's their environment. You know, from an early age, have they been encouraged? Have they had great coaching from an early age? Have they had the support of their family? You know, then you've got to have the physical ability. Have you got the great VO2 max? Have you got the great anaerobic threshold? Have you got the muscular endurance and the strength? But then also, it's about psychology. Are you tough enough? You know, and this is not tough enough for the race. This is tough enough for the hours and hours and days and weeks and months and years of training that it takes to actually reach the top. So it, it, it really is a, a complex, multifactorial approach that you have to take to performance. And that's why so few people actually make it to the very top. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredibly tough, like you said. And, and the race doesn't start. When, when do they say it starts at about 20 miles? 18 it? miles from 18 me, I think, miles yeah. From the elite. And then you think, well, you've still got, actually got eight plus miles to go. And you think, <laughs> yeah. oh, God. And your body's yeah. kind of going, no, this is you know, ridiculous. Let's stop. And you've got to keep Yeah. Absolutely right, on. because I mean, you, you, there's so many insults on the body that, that, are, that are occurring at that time. You've got hypothermia, hypothermia, you know, body temperatures going through the roof, you're trying to regulate that. You're depleting energy at such a fast rate. You're breaking down muscle. You know, all these things are going on whilst you are trying to maintain this incredible, incredible pace at, uh, for these elite guys. Just truly astronomical. It is, you watch them running past and you go, they actually look like they're sprinting, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, for you and I, certainly for me at the moment, they are sprinting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, certainly for me. <laughs> well, well, that's true. <laughs> But um, uh, away from uh, Sunday's race, you you just been involved with uh, helping a guy out who decided that he'd run a marathon in the London Eye? Yeah, yeah. So uh, two great projects recently, actually. A, a guy uh, for charity ran uh, the first ever marathon on the London Eye in one of the pods on a treadmill. Noel Breslin, fantastic event. Uh, all for charity, which, which was brilliant. And then just a couple of days ago, a, a, a colleague of mine came back from uh, the North Pole Marathon as the oldest uh, competitor ever, 56 years of age, and it was his first ever marathon. Oh my goodness. Temperatures down to minus 30, knee deep powder snow, just incredible. So we've had two great successes what from a coaching behind, perspective. What was behind the decision to go and run his first marathon in the North Pole? It was, it was a late midlife crisis. <laughs> you can call it late and midlife. midlife. It's a late life crisis. <laughs> Wow, yeah, but you know, fantastic. And it, it's great because there are these iconic events that people can get involved in, which often drives you. But for me, you know, the London Marathon is one of those. This is yeah. an iconic event. Just to be part of this type of event is just truly incredible. Uh, I've run it five times in a costume, tragically, uh, for a charity that I was involved with. Uh, but it's, it's an incredible experience, absolutely fantastic. And away from running, you are also involved with David Williams training at the moment. He's going to swim the, the whole length of the Thames. Length of the Thames. Well, we're going to swim about 175 miles of it. In one go? <laughs> In one go. No. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we have to get out as we go go along. But So there's intermittent episodes of getting out to recover, to feed. Sleeping? We're going to, we're going to have short episodes of sleep. But the idea is what we're targeting somewhere in the region of five to seven days to swim what is effectively uh, seven times across, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 15 times across the English Channel. 175 miles, and what's he going to average daily then? So you we're going to trot, we're going to trot, we're, we're aiming, and it's flow dependent, but we're aiming somewhere in the region of about 40 miles a day of swimming. It's going to be slightly nuts. He's slightly nuts, but so we know that anyway, don't we? As long as he doesn't get sick by the polluted tap. <laughs> Do you know what, the Thames is fantastic at the moment. The Upper Thames is, is gorgeous, it? yeah, yeah. I, I live on the Thames, we swim there three times a week. Uh, you know, all the triathlete guys are out there on a regular basis. Fantastic location. And, and people do say, is it true that if you drink a can of Coke after you've been swam somewhere dirty, that helps? Or is that just a... I think that's probably a Coke advertisement, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Still out of me. Maybe I just wasn't going to get sick. Uh, no, no, yeah, exactly. Maybe you're right. People tell me vodka. I don't know if that's my friend's. Okay, yeah. <laughs> right, vodka and Coke. Vodka and Coke. I like so, it. So, um, have you had a chance to look at the, any of the fields for men and women's fields for this weekend's race? Well, do you know what? What, what would be great is, for, for me, it's about the Brits. You know, it's a really important year. Yeah. It's the year leading up to 2012. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the one to watch would be Liz Yelling. I mean, you know, for someone like Liz to come out, I mean, 
it, it's, it, it, these are tough events and, and, and the women's field I think actually this year when you look at the women's field the women's field is really strong yeah. really strong Amazing, isn't it? Uh, and it would be great to see someone like Liz come out and really fly uh, but overall it'd be great to see the Brits come out the year prior to the games make a, you know make a mark put yeah. a stamp on it yeah. you know this is London one year out to, to have a really good performance so there's lots of pressure on the athletes there's a lot of pressure but I think I think the guys I think the guys will rise to that you know, it's, it's the one great thing about the London Marathon. I think it's going to be the same for the Olympic Marathon. Is that the British public are incredible. You know, the, 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 there's so many people on the course, and they are so patriotic, uh, and they really do support you on your way. It, it's almost like you're being lifted and pulled along. You know, so that's going to make a difference. So the pressure's there, but it's it's home turf. It's a home audience, and I think that can make the big difference. You don't think it'll be sort of like in the head this time next year? You know, this is going to be. The Olympic. I hope it is in their head yeah. at this time next year because actually a year goes quick. Yeah, it's very quick. You know, and, and actually it is about your preparation now because I think if you start preparing now, by the time you come to the Olympics, you will be in the right place, both physically and psychologically. I think if you try, the concept of trying to ignore it until it actually happens is, is a recipe for disaster. So, you know, when they're out there this weekend, think about the, the Olympics, think about what they're going to be doing at the Games. Because this week, this weekend, they're really telling what's going on. Hopefully, it will um, mean we're going to see some quite special performances. On I think so. Sunday morning, yeah. around about 11, 11.30. And I shall be glued watching it. Yeah, so, I will be as looking well. forward to it. Lovely to talk to you, Greg. You and, too. Uh, good luck with David Walliam. Yeah, yeah thanks. Is it going to be on TV? Yeah, so, so they're making a documentary for Sport Relief, and that'll be shown in 2012. But the whole of the event will be you know, live on radio, television, etc., as it normally is. And so. when does it take place? September. This September coming? This September coming. Wow, okay, so just round the corner. I'm in the wall with him tomorrow morning, so right, it's going to well, be a big one. Well, good luck to you as his coach and good luck to David. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks. Thanks for talking Cheers. to us. Cheers.